It's that time of year. I love it. A cool 68 degrees with the back door open while editing a video. <laughs> I feel for you guys up north, but I might as well enjoy what I got. With our temperatures here being what they are, I'm not the best channel to test out winter riding gear, but we do get the mid-30s when I come home early in the morning after a shift, and I have been testing out some gloves and a helmet liner that some of you might find useful if you're not in absolute frigid temperatures. I got some updates on the bikes, some future projects, which I think a lot of you guys are going to enjoy. And as promised, we're going to take this Eagle One on a real-world range test to find out if it's practical. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to spook him. What I want to know is, can you use it to get to where you want to go, enjoy it for a little bit, and then still get home without having anxiety about running out of battery? Being that time of year, most of you know if you're searching for motorcycle gloves or mountain biking gloves, there's about a thousand different options from a hundred different websites. And depending on how enthusiastic you want to get with your riding, that might dictate what style of gloves you decide to wear. Ever since I had that accident with the Phantom 85 and I tweaked my wrist, I've enjoyed wearing wrist protectors. And these don't really cope well with most riding gloves. This particular pair is pretty thin, but it's fleeced line. I found that at about 25 miles an hour and 32 degrees, it's good enough to get the job done for about 30 minutes of riding. Faster than that, or colder than that, you might want to look somewhere else. But these being so thin, they can fit inside other gloves, and they can fit inside my wrist protectors. Now you can actually find gloves with built-in wrist guards, however they're kind of cumbersome and you might not always want to wear them. For instance, when I'm going on sketchy terrain, I would want to wear my wrist guards. But when I'm on longer trips where I know I'm just going to be cruising and not doing anything enthusiastic, I won't really want my wrist guards just for the added comfort. And that's where these really shine. I can use them with or without the wrist guards. And they keep my hands warm in my environment. And just like most modern gloves, they're touch sensitive, so I had no problems navigating the menu on my phone. There's a number of reasons why I don't care much for wearing the full face helmet on motorized bikes, although I sometimes do, but one of those reasons is that in cold mornings my glasses tend to fog up as soon as I put the helmet on. Yes, there's anti-fog you can get, but I either forget it or I run out, and it's just one extra step that I don't care to deal with when I only have a five minute ride to get to the house. So for this reason, among others, I enjoy wearing my half helmet most of the time. And this underliner cap is really nice because it fully covers your ears, which are usually the most exposed part that gets cold on your face. Obviously for longer trips and certain individuals, this is going to be a different story. But it fits under my half helmet just fine. It doesn't fit in my full face helmet, it's a little too snug, but then again, the full face helmets are usually pretty well insulated, so you wouldn't really need it. A nice little bonus they added were some slots so you could fit your glasses in over your ears to hold them down. I actually find not to use this very often, but it is nice that they thought about that because, well, people who wear glasses are often overlooked when it comes to a lot of hobbies, and riding gear is no exception. Just like with the gloves, it's a thin fleece lined cap that's good down to about 32 degrees at 25 miles an hour for about a half hour. And it has a nice little reflective coating on it, which is a nice added safety benefit, but really you should be wearing a helmet anyways, so this doesn't really matter to me. These weren't given to me and this isn't sponsored, but if you think these might be useful, there's a link in the description for Amazon where you can pick them up. Now for some updates on the bikes. At the moment, the Phantom 85 on the F-Zero is running the 21mm PWK carburetor that we used to have on the old YD100. And I'll leave a link in the description to a silicon adapter that allows you to easily fit this carburetor to a G2 reed. I was finally able to fix the chain rubbing on the tire issue with the F-Zero by simply flipping the rear sprocket over. I didn't do this previously when I was running the 41 roller chain because the clearance was so tight between the caliper, rotor, and chain, I didn't think it was a wise idea. But with the 415H chain, there's just enough room to pull it off, and now we can finally open this bike up. Mm. 
I've reached a top speed of 40 miles an hour with the Phantom 85, and it still had a lot left to give, so we'll try, but this thing makes me nervous. I went ahead and picked up the two-piece cylinder for the YD100, the LD100 cylinder with its corresponding head. We'll be testing that out pretty soon. Before we do, I have an interesting idea with this heat sink that I had talked about doing a long time ago and a viewer recently reminded me about. If it works out, you'll see a video on it. If not, I'm sure I can find a use for this somewhere. And last but certainly not least, some parts from DLH Performance. We have the SAF Super Clutch for a future Minarelli build. We'll be testing a Minarelli with the stock clutch and the Super Clutch, as well as a stock cylinder and a ported cylinder. Look forward to that come January. Along with that order, we also received some G2 Reed stuffer plates and some case stuffers for the Firestorm Zeta 80 as we continue the performance and port work series. Now on to the range test with the Eagle One scooter. When it comes to the bikes, I consider about 20 miles to be good enough to scratch the itch when I want to get out and ride on my day off. So for my riding style, this scooter needs to be able to reach 20 miles as a bare minimum with some battery left to spare. I don't want to crawl home on a couple of volts. I want this thing to still have power by the time we get to the house. And because this is a real world range test, we'll be doing a mix of one and two wheel drive with eco and performance mode engaged. I'll be using two wheel drive anytime we hit rough terrain, hills, trails, and I'll be using eco mode when we're on the long, flat, smooth sections. So I'm not going to bore you guys with the entire trip, I'm just going to give you some of the highlights and then give you my thoughts and opinions as we return. Cause I need to learn to forget everything that drags me down I need to forget everything inside me now Fly speed and Fly from the end So I'm full speed and end Bike guys are into bikes, scooter guys are into scooters. I'm not trying to convince anyone what to ride, but some of you might be interested in both, so here's my thoughts and opinions of the Varla Eagle One after doing 28 real world miles. Full transparency, you'll notice I didn't have a backpack. No tools, no supplies, saving as much weight as I could. I didn't expect this to complete the trip. I was pretty sure that I was gonna be calling a ride to pick me up, mainly because of the gravel section of trail. Now normally, if I was just riding smooth streets, I wouldn't have been this nervous, but leaving the house, I was kind of iffy about it. Small 10-inch tires on loose gravel with leaves and debris all over the place, plus the amount of off-roading we did on the side of the road just to get to the trail because traffic sucks, was something I expected to eat the battery alive. But I underestimated the capabilities of two-wheel drive on a scooter, even with street tires. The front wheel pulls you up over the gravel and into your line, and the back wheel pushes you through it. And this made a huge difference on the gravel trail. It didn't eat the battery up nearly as much as I expected. Now it was only planned to do about 8 miles of gravel riding, but we actually had to backtrack an extra 2 to find the camera that fell off the scooter. Oh. Thank god they still put flashing lights on GoPros. By the time I got back to town I had so much battery left that any time I pulled the throttle in two-wheel drive it felt like it was almost at full charge and it would still pull me up over any obstacle. Well, let's see how she does. She ain't got much left. So I ended up circling the block a bunch of times looking at Christmas lights until my feet were just too tired and it was too dark to get any usable footage. I did stay in eco mode pretty much the entire trip, just mixing it up between one and two wheel drive. And this wasn't really helping us save battery on the trail because full power is always available to the motors to make sure it can pull you through rough situations. So it was trying pretty hard to make sure it kept us at that 15 miles an hour. But eco mode for me is what I usually stay in just as a speed limitation. 
I'm a tall guy and my balance is not great. Going 50 miles an hour on a scooter is fine with me and I'll top out at 20 sometimes when I'm feeling brisk. In my last video I got a handful of comments from some actual scooter guys who know what to expect in the hobby and it turns out that this price bracket for scooters at this power level is very acceptable. This isn't going to convince any of the gas bike guys. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying I now acknowledge the price point of this scooter and compared to the other options which are borderline ridiculous ridiculous, this is definitely something that shines out. In my opinion, these companies are stuck in a numbers game where everybody has to advertise a high top speed to catch your attention. These speeds are just not something that I find realistic to do on scooters. However, these high top speeds mean that these scooters have lots of power, and that power is what I'm interested in, low speed power. The ability to climb over any obstacle and just go through whatever the hell you want is what I love about this thing. And don't get me wrong, I absolutely love the sound of a good two-stroke in the morning, but it is nice to get on this thing and cruise through neighborhoods where you don't normally go because you're pretty much invisible to your surroundings, just nobody hears you, and you can stick around longer and explore. It's something you can do on electric vehicles that you just can't practically do on gas bikes without alerting everybody to your presence. So yes, I do love this scooter, but that's never going to replace a gas bike. The simple ability to refuel on demand and go as far as you physically are limited is something that's irreplaceable by an electric vehicle. So guys, don't get the wrong idea and think that I'm suddenly going to change the channel from gas bikes. You'll see things like these pop up every once in a while, but we're gas bikes through and through. And one last thing I'd like to point out about the Varla Eagle 1. This scooter has been putting in some work. So it's a busy time of year, guys. I've got a lot of things cooking and a lot of things to look forward to. Until next time, ride safe.